Mm -hmm. All right. So I'm mean, at the top of our hour. So if you want to take over from here now. Yes. Okay. okay. Thank you. That's great. We'll be admitting all of our students in now. All right. We're admitting everyone in. And uh, I'll start whenever we go live. Yes, we're live. All right. Thank you. Hi everyone, welcome to Teleshadowing. We are recording this session and live streaming it to YouTube. Teleshadowing is a shadowing program open to all pre-health students from the undergraduate, post-baccalaureate and high school levels. As clinical shadowing opportunities have become limited in virtue of the ongoing pandemic, we are firm in our mission to extend shadowing opportunities to students across the globe. You will receive certification after this session via a quiz and a brief written reflection. We recommend you to complete these quizzes as soon as possible, as there are no extensions after de the deadline has passed. More information can be found on our website at teleshadowing.com. We currently have 60 students in our Zoom room and 22 are watching YouTube Live. You can ask questions on the YouTube Live chat as well as YouTube Live chat as well, and it will be addressed. And finally, we will be having a Q&A session at the end, and we would like to kindly ask to keep your microphones off as it is encouraged to type your questions into the chat box during the session, as the Teleshadowing Working Group will ask your questions at the end. And without further ado, it is a great honor for me to introduce my mentor from high school, Dr. DeShields. I learned from her in high school, and it helped me a lot in polishing my skills as an undergraduate student at the University of Maryland. Dr. DeShields is a multi-specialized and accomplished physician and mentor to students. Dr. DeShields is board certified in internal medicine, oncology, hematology, hospice, and palliative care. She is a clinical assistant professor at the University of Maryland School of Medicine and, at, and a medical director of oncology at the University of Maryland Shore Regional Cancer Center. Now I'd like to request Dr. DeShields to start today's session. Thank you. Thank you, Menahil. It's nice to see you again, and thank you for your invitation. Um, I'm, a, as you know, I'm a pretty un, informal person, um, and, and I welcome the opportunity to answer your questions at the end of the session. Um, it, it, it's truly a delight to be with you. Um, I, I think I've been able to endure in oncology for so many years because of the many, many wonderful people I've met along the way, and just the promise of what comes ahead. Perfect. A better? Okay. Um, uh, board certified medical oncologists um, and board certifications, of course, in internal medicine before oncology. Um, hospice and palliative care medicine, um, that was uh, prior to it becoming an ABIM specialty. And currently, and, and most recently, what I'm excited to share with you is I became board certified in lifestyle medicine, and we'll talk about that later on in the uh, presentation. So the, I think I'm having trouble advancing my slides. So I'm gonna switch back to a different view, Menna Hill. Um, sure, no problem. Oh, there it is, there it goes. Um, sorry about that. And this is where I was born um, in Florida. And the, um, this is Escambia County, Florida. And my hometown is a little place right there at the tip called Century, Florida. No one's ever heard of it. I'm sure you haven't. Um, but most people have probably heard of Pensacola, Florida. So we're about 40 miles away from there. Uh, this is what a typical road in Century, Florida looks like. It's a two-lane highway with a lush greenery on either side. And Florida being uh, a, a basically... Um, you know, a wetland area and kind of swampy. There are lots of alligators and lots of snakes and frogs and other other things. So, you know, I was immersed in, in uh, a very rich and lush environment um, in, in our part of the state. Um, and most people are familiar with Pensacola, Florida, which is known for its sugary sand beaches. It's known for its wonderful seafood. Um, many people would consider this, um, you know, food from heaven. Everything was deep fried, but it's not really that healthy for you, but it certainly does taste good. 
Uh, Pensacola is known for uh, the Blue Angels. Um, it's a naval air station for training naval pilots. And one of the delights of growing up was seeing the, the Blue Angels, these uh, fighter pilots who would fly in close formation to each other. It's, it's an amazing thing to see. And the downside of living in the Gulf Coast, Pensacola is right about here, are the hurricanes. This is the hurricane season last year. Three of them lined up in a row. And this is not uh, atypical um, to have hurricanes in the region, but um, this past year was an extremely hard season uh, for the Gulf Coast because of the number of hurricanes that just battered the coast uh, storm after storm last year. And it's primarily because this beautiful Gulf Coast right here is just a breeding ground for hurricanes. So enough of the environmental lesson this morning, let's get on with it. Um, these were my first patients. When I was in middle school and high school, us, we lived in a rural area and it was not uncommon to find little stray puppies and kittens. Um, and my first hands at being a healer was taking these little uh, creatures and, and giving them a warm place to stay and food um, and milk or whatever they needed and binding up their wounds and trying to find a good home for them. And it sparked um, something in me that um, the healing process is wonderful and it's amazing to be a part of that. Um, when I graduated from high school, I was graduated um, as valedictorian. Um, I received a full scholarship to Florida a &M University for the College of Pharmacy. The pharmacy program was five years, five calendar years, but if one chose, it was possible to um, graduate in four and a half years by going summers. So I had one summer off um, of my college, first college year, freshman year, um, and um, the other, uh, three and a half years was around the clock uh, study um, at the School of Pharmacy uh, without a break. You might have a, a week or two off during the holidays, but basically it was around the year, year round studying. Um, a, a large part of that was uh, lab work um, in, in addition to didactic study. Um, my first summer of my freshman year, I actually worked as a nurse's aide at our local hospital. And my first patient that I really cared for was um, a young lady. I still can see her. She uh, was severely developmentally disabled. Um, and she was uh, paraplegic, had a very large decubitus ulcer. And the my duty as the junior nursing aid was to assist the RN with packing that wound. And the first time I saw it, where the decubitus had eroded down to her sacrum and involving the musculature, um, I thought I would pass out, but somehow I was able to maintain composure uh, as, uh, at 18 years old and assisted the nurse in caring for this patient. Probably couldn't eat for a good day and a half uh, because of the smell and the, the, vis the, the visual and the physicality of it. But then I thought how much worse was her suffering having to endure this. And so with that mindset, um, it solidified that even in the worst, in our worst discomfort as providers, um, we have to always keep in mind the suffering of the patient. After pharmacy school for a year, I worked at Eckert Pharmacy, and this is a, a, a throwback picture of what Eckert drugs used to look like, and I worked in one in Orlando, Florida, that looked exactly like that. Um, Eckert's was the largest chain in Florida at the time. <clears throat> I uh, worked there <clears throat> for about a year, um, and in the process, applied to medical school. Um, I chose Howard University uh, College of Medicine because it was culturally rich and in a metropolitan area. Um, I was uh, chose Howard um, over the two medical schools that I was accepted to in Florida because I really wanted to see a little bit more of the world and a bit more diversity. And Howard University was just a mecca, um, a, a learning opportunity where um, and, and the city was so culturally rich um, and had just a wonderful, wonderful time there. 
This program is about mentorship. So while I'm talking to you about my journey, I'd like to share with you some of the mentors and the people who influenced me and helped me along the way. When I was coming through medical school, there were very few women um, in medicine. Um, and you'll see the, um, the evolution sort of of medicine along the way with some of my mentors. Uh, this is a picture of Dr. LaSalle LaFall. Uh, I'm receiving a certificate for Alpha Omega Alpha Honor Society. Uh, Dr. LaFall was my mentor. Uh, please forgive the quality of these photos. I pulled them out of my uh, some of my albums. Um, Dr. LaFall passed away in 2019. He was professor emeritus at Howard University College of Medicine. He was an astounding surgeon. Uh, and taught us uh, humanitarian lessons as well as um, clinical pearls that are with me to this day. Um, he was the first African-American president of the American Cancer Society. He was first the first African-American president of the American College of Surgeons. He was chairman of the President's Cancer Panel for Presidents George W. Bush and for President Barack Obama. Um, and he has many, many, many um, um, accomplishments to his credit, uh, but these are just a few of them. He was my mentor. He graduated from Florida a &M University also. For a while, I thought I wanted to be a surgeon because he was um, a, 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 a surgeon beyond compare um, and operated on many cancer patients. He trained at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. And so, of course, I wanted to be a surgeon. Um, but then I thought, well, the part I really enjoy most about it is the workup and what happens after the surgery. And that led me towards a path of internal medicine. But I just wanted to share that Dr. LaFall was my first um, mentor in medical school. Um, this is my graduation day. And this is my husband that um, I married. Um, we were married our third year of medical school. Um, the diagram in the back is a pepperoni pizza. That was our um, dietary staple for all of medical school and probably most of uh, residency. Um, so in 1985, we were married. 1986, we both graduated from Howard University College of Medicine. In 1986 through 1990, um, I, I spent my internship residency and chief residency at Christiana Hospital in Delaware. At the time, it was called the Medical Center of Delaware. Now it has expanded um, satellite centers throughout the state of Delaware. And our son is actually a third year resident now at uh, Christiana Hospital. He'll be finishing um, in June of this year. My first mentor in oncology is Dr. Irving Berkowitz. Uh, Dr. Berkowitz passed away in 2006. Um, he was my mentor for medical oncology. I met Dr. Berkowitz um, when I was a resident and just chose oncology. You know, I thought this would be a nice way to uh, get exposure to oncology. I'm going to do an elective. I loved it so much. I signed up for a second elective. Dr. Berkowitz was among the first medical oncologists to practice in Delaware. He established the cancer program at Christiana Hospital. He served as the principal investigator in chief of research for um, the Community Cancer Outreach Program, which is a community-based research program for uh, medical centers, not directly linked to academic centers. Um, and um, it was of great benefit to patients uh, to have community programs of this type because it provided high quality medical research for them, for the 80% of patients who are cared for in the community with cancer diagnoses. He was a tremendous influence, um, a very brilliant, very kind and compassionate gentleman. And during my, at the end of my third year of residency was baby number two. They kind of have a way of just getting in there somehow. Um, and um, that this picture is my chief residency year. Um, the front line are the attending physicians and um, um, preceptors for the medical residency program. The, the second, third, and fourth tier behind me are the, the 30 medical residents that I was responsible for as a chief resident. It was an amazing year, taught me a lot. 
about um, leadership um, and in working with um, um, both attending staff and the residency staff. So it was a, a wonderful year. In July of 1990, right out of uh, fellowship, uh, went right into my, uh, right out of residency, I went right into fellowship at Fox Chase Cancer Center in Philadelphia. Uh, Fox Chase Cancer Center was the first NCI designated cancer center in the United States. Uh, it was a center for basic science research, clinical research, and um, medical oncology, hematology, both surgical radiation and um, medical um, oncology. It was an all cancer hospital. It had 100 beds and every patient in that hospital had a cancer diagnosis and was undergoing treatment. It was a very, very rich learning experience. And much of the research that was conducted at Fox Chase Cancer Center has become the standard of care. I'd like to share with you now some of the mentors I had at Fox Chase Cancer Center. Um, Dr. Robert Kriegel was my um, attending physician and preceptor. Uh, he was, um, his field of study was hematologic malignancies. Dr. Kriegel taught me to read uh, peripheral smears and bone marrows. Um, and uh, he also taught me the very important um, lesson of doing your charts as you go. Don't wait till the end of the day to get them done. He said, do it as you go, because if, it, if, if it's not done in a timely fashion, they're just going to pile up on you and you end up at the end of the week with 40 or 50 charts that have to be completed. Um, other mentor, Dr. Robert Ozels, um, very kind um, and distinguished gentleman. He was chief of medical oncology. Um, Dr. Ozels is responsible for um, researching and uh, fine, refining a treatment regimen for ovarian cancer. That's the standard of care today. The regimen that he worked on at Fox Chase uh, has never been beaten in terms of efficacy um, for the treatment of ovarian cancer. Um, he was uh, a, a large presence um, at um, Fox Chase and very influential. Um, during my second year of fellowship, uh, baby number two arrived, um, and um, part of what um, Fox Chase instilled in me as a medical oncologist was a strong responsibility for always learning, always pushing the envelope in terms of finding better treatments and better ways to manage toxicities associated with chemotherapy um, and teamwork, the importance of teamwork that um, to practice, especially oncology, you're certainly not in a silo. All of the specialties are working together to heal this patient. Starting in the top right, uh, mentors was Dr. Lori Goldstein. Um, she was uh, chair of breast oncology and breast research, has, has hundreds of papers to her credit, um, and a leader in the field of breast oncology. Um, bottom center is Dr. Mary Daly. Dr. Daly was um, a retired lieutenant from the United States Air Force and medical oncologist. At the time, she chaired the Division of Cancer Control and high risk populations, because at that time, no one really knew that there were genes associated with um, certain cancers. We always suspected that there's probably a genetic link when one saw breast cancer in two or three generations. Uh, but she studied it and was one of the authors of the landmark patient uh, paper and discovery of the breast cancer one and breast cancer two genes. Um, and if you were to look at the New England Journal of Medicine back around um, 1992, 93, the original article on the discovery of the breast cancer one and two genes, you'll find Dr. Daly is one of the co-authors, um, a very um, kind, uh, dignified um, individual that um, I learned so much from. And the top left is the molecular cytogenetics team. I was a part of that. Um, 
the individuals um, surrounding Dr. Testa are all physicians in their own right who chose to um, study with Dr. Testa uh, the, the genetic basis of cancer. So my job in that lab, and that's me back there, um, it was to mince up tumors uh, and extract DNA. And then we run Western blots on those tumors and try to identify genes associated with it. So where is that taking us today? Um, Dr. Testa um, and his team were also working on fish fluorescence in situ hybridization, which is a way of, uh, of identifying uh, gene mutations. Um, and, and it is standard of care now. I use that every day in my clinic in refining the treatment plans for my patients. And it also helps to um, establish uh, what the patient's prognosis might look like. So I can still remember the first day I, uh, Dr. Testa called us into the lab and said, look at this. And there it was. He had uh, labeled um, a chromosome uh, with an antibody specific to a particular region on a chromosome. And there it was, it fluoresced underneath the microscope, unforgettable. And um, we're using that technology today. Um, so I was just in a little cog in the wheel in the corner of the lab, just mincing up tumors. So the rest of these brilliant people could do what they needed to do. But it, it certainly um, enriched the learning experience at Fox Chase Cancer Center. So after Fox Chase, I was invited to, invited to come back with Dr. Berkowitz to become a member of his practice, which was a high honor, along with Dr. Wozniak and Dr. Yogesh Patel and Dr. Martha Hosford. Um, Dr. Hosford and I were co-residents. She was a couple of years ahead of me. And then there I was um, joining uh, such a distinguished team. Uh, so Oncology of Associates of Delaware, I was there from 1993 to 1998. Oncology of Associates of Delaware was the first oncology group in Delaware. Medical oncology did not become a specialty until 1974. And those three gentlemen were the leaders in establishing an oncology program at Christiana Hospital. We provided consultations for five hospitals because oncologists at that time were very, very scarce. Uh, there was one main and five satellite offices. Call was one in five from 2 p.m. Friday to 8 a.m. Monday. And call was uh, even more intense than being in the office every day. Uh, when not on call, office hours typically eight to five, Monday through Friday, in inclusive of hospital rounds on your own patients. And at the end of 1993 was baby number three. So I wanna talk a little bit about what I do every day. Oncology is the study and treatment of cancer. Um, um, the um, oncology has three components, medical oncology, surgical oncology, and radiation oncology. Medical oncology deals with medications, and now medications include immune therapy, monoclonal antibody therapy, targeted therapies. But basically, it's a systemic therapy to treat. Um, a patient, something taken internally, either by mouth or intravenously. Uh, sometimes it's topical, but mostly intravenously or by mouth to treat a particular cancer. The medical oncologist typically leads um, in the treatment plan for advanced cancers uh, once it's been diagnosed. Uh, often uh, after a patient's cancer is treated and enters remission, the oncologist provides long-term care and follow-up. Surgical oncologists specialize in removing tumors um, and palliative procedures. Radiation oncologists, of course, uh, specialize in the use of radiation for cancer treatment. I'd like to show you a picture of a mammogram. Uh, you might have heard of, of um, 3D mammograms or tomosynthesis versus standard mammography or mammogram. This is a mammogram of a woman who has rather dense breasts. And the density are those starry shaped configurations, sort of looks like a spider web. It makes it a little bit, makes it significantly more difficult to identify a, um, a particular mass, which is hidden right there. But with subtraction, um, digital mammography or tomosynthesis, um, 
the background uh, noise, um, if you will, is, is lessened so that the tumor is actually highlighted. I'm going to show you a series of, of images and tell you a little bit of the story behind some of the um, images and how um, these uh, patients were treated. These are not my actual patients, but they're schematics. Back um, in 1990 through, I would say, 2000, the only thing that medical oncologists had to, um, for treatment was chemotherapy. Chemotherapy was harsh. It was toxic. I made individuals very sick. And early in my fellowship, there were not very good medicines to manage uh, some of the symptoms of, of cancers, particularly nausea and vomiting. Patients would literally be, uh, they, they were very ill for days after every treatment because there were not medicines like ondansetron and Zofran to manage um, delayed nausea and vomiting from chemotherapy. So we sent patients home doing the best we could with the bag of uh, a bottle of compazine, um, a bottle of Valium or, or Ativan to help calm the nerves. And they would basically just have to ride it out. Uh, things are much better now, thankfully. Targeted therapies uh, are, are therapies that are specifically designed to address one genetic aberration um, in a particular tumor. And by doing so, treatment is more effective and less toxic and much more specific. Uh, tamoxifen and um, aromatase inhibitor therapy drugs like letrozole were probably the first in terms of targeted therapy for breast cancer. And it targeted the estrogen receptor, basically estrogen receptor blockers. Estrogen, when it um, turns on the cell, causes uh, gene uh, transcription and activation leading to cell division and, and uh, mutagenesis, mutagenesis um, um, might leads to um, cells becoming um, more resistant to therapy over time. Um, and downstream from that is uh, cyclin dependent kinases four and six. So it's possible to block the estrogen and progesterone receptor and do that effectively, but cells have another pathway of getting turned on, and that's through the kinases and uh, cyclin-dependent kinases. So the new kid on the block target therapy that's really been a game changer for patients uh, with metastatic breast cancer are drugs like Ibrantz and uh, Kisqually um, um, that are uh, specifically designed to target or inhibit the cyclin-dependent kinases. This is a PET scan of a patient um, who has metastatic breast cancer. And if you look here uh, to the right, you'll see that is the primary breast mass. The correlate to that is right here uh, on, on their image. Um, and here, there, it, there's the breast mass rather, and this is the liver mass. I, um, um, and then in the liver, there's several nodules and you can see one there, you can see one there. There are also image in the bone, which can be seen there. And then again, in the sagittal image here. Uh, so this is a patient in 1990, when I was a fellow, we would meet and we would say, we'll do the best you can. We'll give chemotherapy and your prognosis is probably less than six months. And in fact, most of those individuals would die within six months. Uh, or to a year, because the only treatment then was probably chemotherapy, which may or may not work very well. And chemotherapy was like a shot in the dark back then. Uh, there were um, different types of uh, many subtypes of cancer now um, that that we understand a whole lot better to tell us that chemotherapy might work well for this one, but it's not going to do anything at all for that one. Uh, and for this one, you need a cyclin uh, kinase inhibitor. And for this one, tamoxifen alone will work very well. And, you know, for this one, you might need Herceptin. So with research, we've been better able to define what type of cancer it is and where the target is, resulting in more effective results. So one example of that is HER2 positive tumor. The HER2 receptor sits atop the cell. This is a little schematic. 
uh, excuse me, this is the HER2 receptor here. Herceptin is a monoclonal antibody against uh, the um, HER2 receptor. It binds to it, prevents the HER2 uh, receptor from becoming phosphorylated and trans uh, migrating the cell membrane so that it turns on the uh, cell uh, replication cycle uh, within the nucleus. So Herceptin has been a game changer for metastatic breast cancer patients. And this is a typical story. Um, about four years ago, I met a young woman. She was about 42 years old in the hospital in a lot of pain from, brain, from bone metastases throughout her body. She had shortness of breath from a large tumor. And during her workup, di discovered that she had liver metastases the liver was biopsied, found that it's a HER2 overexpressed tumor. She went into intensive therapy with chemotherapy plus uh, Herceptin and entered a complete remission with uh, resolution of the lung mass, resolution of liver masses, resolution of her bone metastasis, which you can't see here. She's still alive about four years later now. She's just on hormone therapy uh, to manage the ER positive component of it. She got tired of anti-HER2 therapy, which typically goes on for at least two years or more. She says, well, I just want to see how I do without having any IV therapy for a while. She's doing just fine. And this is after she, you know, had basically planned her funeral, did the Make-A-Wish Foundation thing, you know, Disney World and everything the first year of her diagnosis. And then, you know, four years later, you know, we're very pleased that she's still doing uh, very, very well. So this is the, a typical Herceptin story. It's an aggressive tumor. It's often widespread at the time of diagnosis, but there's very effective treatment for it. Lung cancer, for this year in 2020, among all of the bad news, there was some good news from the world of oncology in that um, for the first time, the cancer curve decreased for lung cancer in a major way because most individuals, even with stage four lung cancer, are surviving for a year or longer, which, was, which is unprecedented. Um, in the past, lung cancer patients basically had a life expectancy of six months or less, regardless of what you did for most of them, especially if they were advanced stage three or four. Now, stage four patients are entering remissions, and it's because of immune therapy. Uh, you might see advertisements on television about immune therapy, but there are two ways, we, the um, two theories surrounding how immune therapy works. One is that the cancer cell itself finds a way to cloak itself and hide from the uh, native immune system. And secondly, the immune system may or may not be. Um, in, um, a, a able to mount a sufficient immune response to a particular malignancy. What um, immune therapy does, and you probably recognize this structure, right? This is an immunoglobulin structure, the FC heavy chain, light chains. So um, everything you learn along the way kind of comes together somehow. And, and uh, that's what I, the, the longer I'm in medicine, the more I'm fascinated by what I learned and tucked away earlier on in my career comes back around. You know, when we were studying immunology in medical school and in undergrad, it's like, oh yeah, receptors, antibodies, yeah, I get it. But here we are using that um, as a form of anti-cancer therapy now. So what happens with immune therapy is that the cancer cell is uncloaked, uh, its stealth device is gone, and the T cells are activated uh, by these drugs. And so it amounts a more robust immune response. That's a very simple cartoon, but um, there have been amazing results with immune therapy. Um, I actually have a, a patient now that I'm caring for. This is this could almost be her CT. Um, she also has congestive heart failure with an ejection fraction of about twenty percent, but and and unable to take chemotherapy. So we did a molecular profile found out that her tumor overexpressed PDL1 and using single agent chemotherapy for her, she has entered a complete remission um, without any exacerbation of her congestive heart failure. So this patient um, um, immune therapy for her was definitely the right um, ticket to in remission. And immune therapy also works for 
uh, brain tumors, targeted therapies, EGFR inhibitors, epidermal growth factor receptor inhibitors also cross the brain, blood brain barrier. Um, and this is a schematic of um, cerebellar metastases uh, to the right and to the left. Uh, this is after several months of therapy where the left lesion has resolved and you have uh, just a remnant of this large lesion that was once there. And these are typical pictures of what we're seeing now in medical oncology. Before, when I started oncology 30 years ago, we were looking at a prognosis of um, a few weeks, maybe a couple of months, but these individuals can enter remission and many of them are fully functional. There, there's not the debilitating side effects that once uh, was the, the, the norm with chemo. This is a PET scan showing diffuse bone metastases. Uh, there are metastases in the sternum and throughout the ribs. All of these bright spots represent uh, metastases. And I would, this, this is typically a patient who might have prostate cancer. So prostate cancer therapy um, is, is driven by testosterone inhibition and it works at the hypothalamic pituitary axis with LHRH uh, inhibitors, which uh, shut off the production of uh, LHRH, which leads to the production of testosterone in men and estrogen in women. We use the same principle also for ER positive breast cancers in premenopausal women to render them menopausal and reduce estrogen uh, production in their bodies, thereby starving the cancer, if you will, of any essential nutrient for growth. So that's how prostate cancer works. The antiandrogens work by um, preventing the conversion of cholesterol um, to adrenal androgens to uh, testosterone. So there's a one, uh, two punch with Lupron plus antiandrogens that has really um, improved the um, outcomes and survival for men with metastatic, especially hormone refractory uh, prostate cancer. So this is a gentleman who, this is a bone scan. Um, of someone who had prostate cancer. And these are the kidneys there. And of course, that's the bladder concentrating the isotope. But this is what we would call a super scan. And there is a metastasis in every bone. There's the femoral neck. And this is a, a pathologic fracture waiting to happen um, if, if there's no intervention. This person is probably also um, losing weight they probably also have uh, hypercalcemia at this point because of the amount of lytic disease of the bone. The kidneys are probably not functioning optimally because of hypercalcemia. So this is a very, very sick person. Uh, in fact, you can almost see where there's not that much muscle mass uh, compared to this particular scan where uh, this patient's been treated for a number of months and appears to have reached a complete remission the only thing that's remaining uh, is the uh, uptake of isotope in the kidneys and the bladder. The rest of this disease has completely gone away. Do I see this in practice? Yes. Yes, I do. More often than not. But in 1990, when I first started oncology, this person probably would have died within, within three months of uh, hypercalcemic uh, renal failure. So speaking of that, uh, we'll change gears to hospice and palliative care medicine, my second specialty. And you might ask, well, how do we get from, from medical oncology, life-saving measures to hospice and palliative care medicine? Unfortunately, that the great responses I just showed you are not the norm for, uh, for everyone. There's still a significant number of patients who succumb to cancer at some point. And hospice and palliative, palliative care medicine for me is an extension of my practice. Um, the difference between palliative care and hospice is that palliative care primarily um, focuses on improving quality of life. Hospice does too, but hospice is more finite. Palliative care is a continuum. 
Um, so palliative care is very well suited to individuals with chronic medical illnesses such as COPD, congestive heart failure, uh, even cancers that um, are, are, are metastatic and have to be treated for a long time. Um, patients with dementia and who have uh, complications of dementia are, are good candidates for palliative care. Is still set up according to the hospice model of interdisciplinary teamwork, pain and symptom management, um, and focuses on preparing the patient and family for what might lie ahead. <clears throat> hospice, on the other hand, is palliative care for patients at the end of life. It means that there is a qualifying illness that says that unless this process, this disease or medical condition is unaltered, this person will probably die within six to 12 months. And with that, a patient has a certifiable terminal illness that qualifies them for hospice. Um, hospice care mostly occurs at home, but it can occur anywhere. Um, sometimes for those who don't have a primary caregiver at home, hospice is provided in a facility. For those who have escalated symptoms, refractory pain that can't be managed at home, the general inpatient unit within a hospital under the hospice benefit is um, required for a few days to stabilize the patient. Then they're released either to a facility or back home. Um, the hospice residential facility is available in some communities. Our community in Talbot County has a, um, a hospice residential facility. Um, it's a 12 bed unit um, that um, provides extraordinary care for patients and families at the end of life. The hospice interdisciplinary team consists uh, basically of all of the allied health professionals who one would find within any hospital system. But the difference is the hospice IDT team really works as a unit. Um, the patient is the center of care and the disciplines come to the patient as opposed to the patient going to the discipline. For example, um, the hospice team meetings uh, involve all of these professionals, uh, the hospice medical director, the social workers, the counselors, the bereavement coordinators, the volunteers. And the question of the day is, what does this patient need to improve their comfort level to prepare them for death? What does the family need? And the discussion begins um, after that about what each discipline can contribute to ensure the quality of care and comfort for the patient and their family members. So this is a big slide, but just remember that the IDT team provides whatever the patient needs to be comfortable at home. Equipment, medications, physical therapy, speech therapy, music therapy, art therapy, pet therapy, um, and of course, drugs and medical supplies and equipment, but um, whatever the patient and family needs, even short-term bereavement. Let's imagine that with long-term caregiving, the wife of an elderly gentleman is becoming very tired. Um, hospice can arrange for respite for a week where the loved one is taken to a facility, give that person a week to visit a relative or do something to uh, enrich their lives with the assurance that their loved one's being cared for. And with hospice and palliative care, to get there, one must have an end of life discussion, which includes advanced care planning, the advanced directive and goals of care. There's a very good article um, in the New England Journal Resident 360, and I referenced, referenced uh, it in this uh, slide presentation that gives a very comprehensive discussion of these different aspects of end of life discussions. One question I get asked a lot is do patients really wanna know if they have enough, they only have a short time to live? But there are studies that have been done for that and yes, <clears throat> The majority of, of patients and close family members do want to know because they have plans to make. There are things they want to do. 
and it's kind of a disservice if that person does not know. But there are distinct cultural differences, and we have to respect that. For instance, yesterday, um, I, uh, or rather, I'm caring for a young woman, 42 years old, with a glioblastoma multiforme of the brain that has unfortunately spread despite our best efforts. And now it's affecting her meninges and cerebrospinal fluid. The mortality with that condition is extremely high. Very few people live beyond a few weeks to a couple of months. She's unable to speak and communicate her wishes because of expressive aphasia. And she has left most of her, all of her care um, and um, healthcare, um, her healthcare agent is her brother. And I called her brother when I reviewed her MRI scan and, and told him that this is the situation. Um, I don't think there's very much more the medical team can do for her other than keep her comfortable. And it's time to transition to hospice. And his response was, I appreciate you telling me, Dr. DeShields, but I don't want my sister to know. Um, I would rather her die unexpected, unexpectedly and not ever really knowing what her prognosis is because I'm afraid she'll give up hope. That's a whole nother discussion. It really is an ethical discussion. But there are instances where, for some reason, mostly, I think, it has to do with individual beliefs, cultural beliefs, spiritual beliefs, that families don't want their loved ones to know. More commonly, I see children don't want their elderly parent to know. Um, so the approach I take and the individuals who work with me, especially the hospice team, is that we respect your wishes. We would do our best to treat the patient as long as it doesn't violate medical ethics. And, it, and as long as we first do no harm, which is the principle of the Hippocratic Oath, I would not administer uh, futile therapy. Um, I would not administer anything that will harm the patient. At some point, um, I do believe that most patients understand that their time is limited. It's almost intuitive. And I've had situations where patients whose families have tried to hide it from them, when I talk with them one-on-one, -on -one, they, they will tell me, Dr. DeShields, I know I don't have much time. And so I don't stress over that so much. Um, we'll go on and support the patient. Um, and I will told her brother that I will discuss this with the other members of the medical team so that we're all on the same page. And we will figure this out with you. Um, I didn't feel that it was the right situation to um, be confrontational with him about it or be terribly dogmatic about it, number one, because we've always had a good patient-physician uh, family relationship. And secondly, I understand how distressing it is to see a 42-year-old sister die. Um, and I did not want to impose harm in that way. Other physicians might, uh, and other providers might have taken a different approach, but this is my personal approach. And over the years, I've found that um, a, we, we somehow come to a meeting of the minds and um, the um, issue of whether to tell the person or not tell the person, it, it becomes a non-issue at some point. So I'll leave it at that. It's one of those things that's highly individualized and in that you have to figure it out in the context of the person you're caring for. Advanced care planning. This is from the New England Journal um, of Medicine Resident 360. It identifies surrogates and treatment preferences. For instance, if you're unable to speak for yourself, who's your healthcare agent? And then secondly, would you want to be intubated or do you want to have um, artificial life support, artificial nutrition, dialysis, et cetera, et cetera? This can start at any 
point in time in a patient's medical journey, even when they're completely healthy. Um, many people have strong opinions about what they want done with their bodies if they're unable to speak to, for themselves or if they're incapacitated without the expectation to make a full recovery. So it's never too early to do advanced care planning. An advanced directive is a document. It's a document that puts the patient's wishes in writing. Um, it's a legal document. Um, and in some states, a medical order for life-sustaining therapy or physician's order for uh, life-sustaining therapy are accepted as a working document for medical decision-making. The emphasis is on working document because sometimes these documents will change. For instance, <clears throat> um, 70 year old gentleman has an advanced directive. I don't want CPR or intubation, but he needs to have hernia surgery. What happens if he codes from an anaphylactic reaction during recovery? Is he, are you going to deny CPR or resuscitation for a perfectly healthy gentleman that has all probability of returning to a normal life if he survives this anaphylactic event? Well, in most cases, the, that advanced directive will be overturned for that specific reason. It would be different if that gentleman developed um, clinical brain, he was brain dead or some catastrophic event happened, his kidneys failed, his lungs failed, his heart failed. Totally different scenario. So the most form is a living document. It might change depending upon the situation, but the basic tenets of the um, person's uh, wishes is always respected. Goals of care discussions, you'll have to have many of those in your career. You might even have to have them with your family members. Um, it usually occurs for seriously, critically, a terminal ill patients when the prognosis is guarded or uncertain. And I have this discussion with all of my patients with advanced malignancies. Um, the goals of care are focused primarily on life prolonging therapy. Uh, they may be focused on assuring comfort with the willing to try some life sustaining therapy, or it can be exclusively for comfort. When goals of care conversations occur, please make sure you have time. Make sure you have space so you're not in a crowded little room where anxieties might flare. Uh, if you have the opportunity, give your pager or cell phone to someone else to turn it off. Many times uh, we need to just take a moment and I take a moment to just reflect on who that person is and um, what might occur, what questions the family or the patient might have before entering those types of discussions. And I start by saying, well, what do you understand about your illness? What do you understand of what you, about what you've been told? Sometimes you'll be surprised, you know, patients will say, you told me you were going to cure this metastatic cancer. And you say, well, I never really said that, but that was their interpretation of it. So we have to make sure we're starting out on the same page. Find out what the patient knows and then listen to how they respond. Um, I try not to be rushed. I speak very slowly. Um, I discover what the patient wants at the end. Do you want to continue treatment? I wouldn't advise it because of these reasons. Um, can you, um, um, does the patient want um, to go into palliative care for a while or do they want to proceed with hospice care? And then we create a finalized plan. So the flip side of medical oncology and medical treatment in general is lifestyle medicine. This is, a, is an emerging field of medicine that looks at getting back to the basics of healthcare. Uh, we spend our lives learning how to treat diseases. Lifestyle medicine is focusing on pre preventing diseases. And I kind of stumbled upon this by attending a meeting in Boston about two years ago. And it just looked interesting. Lifestyle medicine, I wanted to know more about it. And the American College of Lifestyle Medicine defines lifestyle medicine as using evidence-based guidelines with food, 
exercise, um, social connections, spiritual practices that either prevent or cure chronic diseases or at the least um, helps to um, de-intensify the complications of chronic diseases. This is the um, emblem of lifestyle medicine. Um, it didn't come out so well, but if you go online, type in um, American College of Lifestyle Medicine, you'll see their mission statement and the tenets of lifestyle medicine. I pass this out to my patients, six ways to take control of your health. Really easy, easier said than done though, because dietary modification is probably one of the hardest things of all for patients I, and for individuals. I think it's even harder to modify the diet than it is to modify activities. Just want to take some time now to show you um, where I practice. This is the uh, Regional Cancer Center in Easton. It's an all one floor building, it's easily accessible. Parking is free. Uh, there are no parking garages. You drive up in the little portico there and you get out of your car and you greet it. And if you need a wheelchair, someone comes out and it meets you with the wheelchair. And, um, you know, it, it's um, uh, very, very um, friendly to patients' families. And these are some of the people I work with. And each one of them pays plays such an important role. I just want to share them with you. This is Carol and this is Debbie. These are the two people we, you meet upon entering the University of Maryland Shore Regional Health Cancer Center. They're the greeters. Um, this is Jennifer Diederich. She's a PharmD that I work closely with in terms of, of, of treatment planning, drug therapies. She'll tell me, um, you know, if I want to look at regimen A and regimen B, if there's equal efficacy, which one is most um, economical um, for the for the patient in the center? Cancer therapies now run into the hundreds of thousands of dollars, so we have to use our resources widely. And she's an expert at um, helping to do those things. Um, she's also monitoring with me patient labs. She's looking at drug interactions. Um, you know, she'll say, Dr. DeShields, this patient's on um, an enzyme-inducing anti-epileptic drug. And so we're going to have to increase their dose of irinotecan to compensate for that. So those are vital pieces of information that helps to enhance patient care. So everyone's role is, is, is extremely important. This, on the left is Eugenia Scott. She's Director of Oncology Services. They're in their scrubs because of COVID. Um, she is um, manages the breast center and the cancer center to the right is Chanel Lake. Uh, she works also at the University of Maryland, Baltimore. Uh, sometimes she's the Director of Nursing for Medical Oncology and Radiation Oncology. To uh, the top, upper top are the support staff for radiation oncology, uh, the two nurse practitioners and the two medical assistants. At the bottom are the three chemotherapy oncology certified nurses, uh, Susan uh, Henry, she's a 20 plus year veteran in oncology. I met Susan when I first came to Easton over 20 years ago. Leah Mingos is the newest member of the team. Amy Bickling, I've worked with for over 20 years. And of course, there's Jenny. And Mr. Emmanuel James is a general multiple myeloma. He has had myeloma now for almost 10 years. He's been through a bone marrow transplant. And he's currently on his third line of therapy and is entering remission for a, um, uh, for a fourth time uh, with multiple myeloma, which used to be a deadly disease in two years for almost everybody. Um, this is my team that I work with every day in my office. Um, to the left is Heather Cannon. She's the manager. Alicia Summers um, just joined us um, uh, about a month ago. Kamisha Roberts, physician assistant. She's our practice coordinator. She does a lot of work with the oral drugs. She does the ordering. She does the patient follow-up, uh, maintains our oral 
oncolytic protocol to make sure patients are compliant, side effects and labs monitored. Um, <clears throat> and she also arranges for injectables in the office. She's been with me since I was her mentor uh, in her physician's assistant program over, I think Kamisha joined around 2007. This is Kimberly Bryce, she's a nurse practitioner um, that joined us about four years ago. She's my right hand. We see patients together. Um, and Terry Doolin, uh, medical assistant, uh, works with me also. Uh, Terry does injections. She checks patients in the rooms. Um, and also she um, is in charge of the COVID protocol, cleaning protocol for our office to make sure that after every patient, everything is wiped down um, according to CDC and University of Maryland standards. These are two of the radiation oncologists that I work with, Dr. Emily Kowalski on the left, Dr. John on the right. We're in the same building. Many times during the, the week, uh, we're in consultation with each other and the benefit is they can walk to my office around the corner or I can walk to their office. We look at x-rays, we look at uh, various imaging together. We discuss patients at tumor board once a week. We discuss patients uh, during the week um, to optimize their plan of care. I've known Dr. Mastander has been there over 20 years uh, Dr. Kowalski just joined us last year. Um, a typical workday for me, this is my workstation to the left. Um, uh, we're, our medical platform is Epic. <clears throat> and typically um, I'm working in Epic and my second screen is looking at uh, images um, of, and, and there's some other things around there, coffee cups and what have you. Uh, but this is my basic workstation, and this is a typical workday. Um, I, I, I would strongly advise that as busy as you are, uh, find what works for you and find something each day, if it's no more than five or 10 minutes to look forward to, to say, this is my special treat, whether it's a, a cup of coffee or whether it's, you know, just sitting in the park looking at trees or you know, listening to music or, or find something inspirational or something you look forward to every day because this is a demanding profession. So my day starts about five in the morning. Uh, usually I'm up, so have adequate time for quiet time, medication, meditation, uh, exercise. I practice piano either first thing in the morning or either in the evening when I come home. I usually I'm rolling into work at 7.30 or before. Um, the first part of the morning, first hour is to review chart and discuss our, all of our cases that day that the nurse practitioner will be seeing. The nurse practitioner meets with the, um, the cancer center nurses um, and pharmacists for a team huddle for about 15 minutes to discuss the patients that are coming in for treatment that day to identify any problems for, uh, prospectively or if any labs that need addressing. My clinic runs from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. I very rarely take lunch breaks. In fact, I work right through lunch. So from 9 to 3.30 uh, is basically, you know, uh, go time. Um, three to four is probably correspondence where I'm calling patients back regarding lab results. Um, with the social media now, with Doc Halo and text messaging, most of my colleagues, if there's an immediate question, they will text me during the day and say, hey, Mary, can you do this? Or can I send you this patient? And I'm texting, you know, Chris, can you look at this man for me? And, you know, we're communicating during the day in the midst of doing this. <clears throat> at the end of the day, I'm doing correspondence back to patients, usually uh, getting back to them regarding questions that the practice coordinator or the NP can't handle. And then four to five thirty, um, you know, that's usually meeting times um, or folded into that time of day. So, you know, each day um, is probably at least a ten-hour day, close to a twelve-hour day. Um, but all of that time is not direct patient care. Um, I like this quote by Hippocrates. Excuse me. Let me try to get that back. 
that wherever the art, the medicine is love, there's also a love of humanity. And I don't think you, the two can be separated. That what we do as healers um, is it cannot be separated from or should not be separated from our love of people. And um, it is an honor to be a physician. And it's an honor to work with so many other dedicated professionals who are non-physicians, but their roles are every bit as important. So, um, you know, I, I um, commend you on having and, uh, and creating this tele-mentoring session. Um, it's been a pleasure to speak with you this morning. I hope I didn't go over and glad to answer your questions. And I, and I will also, um, Mena Hill, it's perfectly okay to share my email. Um, if someone would like to send me an email um, and ask a question uh, beyond the, the scope of today, that's okay. So I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Dr. DeShields. That's very generous of you, definitely. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you so much for that incredibly informative session. And Dr. Shields, we have received many questions and the Teleshadowing Working Group has compiled the most frequently asked ones. I'm okay. going to request Amna to ask the questions mm -hmm. and I'll pass it off to her. Thank you, Dr. Oh boy, that was funny. Um, I had a lot of help um, and thank you for that question um, because um, in the midst of, um, of getting our education and fulfilling our calling in our professional lives, Real life happens. Um, so what I did was when, I, when my husband and I were planning children, we tried to find kind of a resting place or a plateau um, in, in my schedule so that I had more elective time or I was on an ambulatory rather than in a lot of inpatient um, um, rotations, especially during the latter months of pregnancy, I would say that uh, during the first three months, you're not feeling that great, but you're, you're not physically um, incapacitated, you know, by the bulk of pregnancy. So for those last couple of months, I really tried to plan it. So I'd be on an elective and maybe a little vacation time after that to um, accommodate um, the postpartum period. And so that, you know, if anything were to become complicated during that uh, third trimester, then I would have a little bit more room in my schedule to accommodate that. And it's typically easier to do if you're on an outpatient elective uh, than it is if you're on an, if in doing a MICU rotation or, um, you know, a something like that, or a cardiac ICU rotation or a floor rotation. So that was one of the ways. During fellowship, it was a little bit trickier. Fellowship, the first year was very intense, very clinical, uh, a lot of floor inpatient time. But the second year was primarily research time and lab time. And you saw the lab that I worked in. So that pro provided a little bit of a plateau there. Now, my third child was completely unexpected. So I went into my first job, you know, just finding out that I was expecting our third child that we hadn't planned. Uh, it worked out because the, the group I work with is just extremely generous. Um, and Dr. Berkowitz, and I had known from residency, so it was not an issue. But um, those are some of the ways to do it. If you can plan your latter pregnancy and um, postpartum period during elective rotations, um, it's probably a little bit um, easier than if you were to have that during your um, inpatient rotations. I hope that helped. <laughs> the very, that is a very sophisticated question. Negative breast cancer, which is an aggressive breast cancer, it disproportionately affects younger women and African-American women. Um, and traditionally very hard to treat because there's only one treatment option or there was only one treatment option to date and that was chemotherapy. 
as opposed to the ER positive, PR positive tumors where one could use tamoxifen or an aromatase inhibitor or the HER2 positive tumors where Herceptin and pertuzumab, and now there are three or four other medicines that can be used. So triple negative breast cancer is a more difficult cancer to treat. The research continues. Within the past year, immune therapy is coming on the forefront for a metastatic triple negative breast cancer. Um, and there are some, some promising uh, results from early studies. So, you know, that's having a very, very close look right now. Um, the conversely, triple negative breast cancer is the most responsive to chemotherapy. So when I see someone with triple, ne triple negative breast cancer, which has been around for a long time, we just didn't label it as such, um, I will tell them that this is an aggressive tumor. But it's one of those instances where chemotherapy works the best. So we're going to do our best to eradicate it. Second thing is if triple negative breast cancers respond well to chemotherapy and do not come back within three years, then the risk of it typically becomes um, less of a threat uh, than it is during the first three years after diagnosis. So uh, that's the unique aspects of triple negative breast cancer. It's aggressive. Chemotherapy is the only treatment, but chemotherapy works well. I really love these questions. Um, chemotherapy was effective in the past because it was non-selective. Um, in the past, when I started uh, oncology, chemotherapy was all that was available to treat almost every tumor there, with the exception of tamoxifen and loop for breast cancer and Lupron for prostate cancer. So just imagine that um, you have a garden full of weeds and I'm a gardener. Um, you have chick weeds and crab weeds, and you have, you know, all of these dandelions and which I think are beautiful weeds, but weeds nonetheless. You have all these different varieties out there, and you're using one pesticide. Well, what happens? The dandelion might die, but you still have the crab weed and the chick weed. So what's that tells us? It tells us that there's something different about these different. Um, weeds in the garden, and there you have to have a different approach. So what's different is with the research that's gone into treatment of cancer, um, it is possible now to, one, identify subtypes within a category of tumor. For instance, breast cancer, there are different subtypes. There are ER positive, PR negative, ER positive, uh, PR positive, there's HER2 positive, HER2 negative, and various permutations of that. And so with that, it's possible to identify um, which treatment is going to work best for a particular variety of tumor. For instance, if it's HER2 negative, one would not use Herceptin. But if it's HER2 positive, Herceptin makes every um, bit of difference in getting that individual into remission. So chemotherapy was all we had when I first started oncology. Now there are a lot of other tools um, that can be used to, uh, to effectively treat cancer. Well, immune therapy, um, there are, um, and it has really evolved and it's still evolving. The story's not complete because research continues. Um, the type of immune therapy that's used really depends upon a type of cancer, type of malignancy. Um, for instance, one would not use the same type of immune therapy for a lymphoma that one would use for lung cancer, or you wouldn't use the same thing for a bladder cancer as you might use for a colon cancer. So it really depends upon the origin of the tumor <clears throat> and um, where the targets are. And so that's how immune therapy is selected. There's, I wouldn't say one particular drug is better than another. It's, it, 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 there are, are different indications for each drug. So that's the magic of oncology is getting to learn all this stuff and, and put it all together. <clears throat> now, those, those are very good questions. How do I have time for it? 
at Fox Chase, it was ingrained upon us that clinical research is extremely important because today's research is tomorrow's cure. And that it indeed has happened in my career. In my 30 years, I've seen medicines such as Taxol, that was a phase one drug when I was a fellow, become the standard of care and cure for not only ovarian cancer, but breast cancers um, and other malignancies. So for me, not to do research, um, but what was a never computed with me. So in fact, when I moved to Easton from Delaware, Christiana, which was a rich research center and still is, there was not a research center at the at our small cancer center. And part of my work as medical director was to get that program established. Um, how do I find time for it? But there all, remember, there are always other people helping. Um, basically, identify the patient, uh, talk with them that you might be a candidate for a research study. This is the intent of the research study. And I would like for you to talk to Christina Weisenborn, who's our clinical research nurse, about it. And what Nina's job is, is she talks to the patient, spends as much time as they need. She prepares a packet for them. Um, for them to review at home. Um, and then Nina will tell me what level of interest the patient has and whether they're um, in, eligible or not. So there's always, there are, how I should phrase this, that I'm not doing this alone. There are a lot of other people that are helping me and that's their specialty is to uh, work in this particular field um, to um, enhance patient care. The second part of the question is about if you want to do clinical research, do you have to have a PhD? No, you don't. I don't have a PhD. I admire people who do have MD PhDs because that does more or less open them up to more of the uh, basic science and bench research grants that are out. Uh, but it, but many MDs do clinical research. Um, but I think to do bench research, uh, basic science research, having that PhD is, is helpful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is a very smart group, my goodness. Um, what, there, there are many theories. The answer is we do not know. But there are many theories. One is the stem cell theory that at the onset of a cancer, before it becomes visible by eye or by uh, palpation, that particular cancer has already evaded the immune system and there are cells that have escaped, they are systemic, they're in circulation, they're looking for a home. And we think that home is the bone marrow and it's called the stem cells theory. That's cancer stem cells migrate to the bone marrow and um, stay there hidden uh, evading immune surveillance until an opportune time to become uh, mutagenic. Um, so that's one theory, but the basic answer is we don't know. One of the roles of adjuvant therapy after someone has surgery for high risk malignancies is to give chemotherapy or immune therapy, a targeted therapy. And the goal is to eradicate that cancer stem cell if at all possible and to prevent relapses down the line. Is it successful? Sometimes it is, sometimes it's not for reasons we don't understand. For instance, I've been in practice long enough to see individuals um, who've been cured of one malignancy return to me five, six years later with another malignancy. Um, sometimes during the evolution of treatment for a patient's breast cancer, a relapse in the liver, looks a little bit different from the, the breast primary. For instance, the breast primary might be HER2 positive, but the metastasis in the liver is HER2 negative. Go figure. I haven't figured that out yet. With the exception of cancer is heterogeneous, that there are subpopulations of cells within any particular tumor. And those subpopulations exhibit variable behavior. So there are many unknowns um, in, in oncology, but that's what makes the field so exciting. We're learning 
along the way and treatments are improving along the way. How often, if ever, does it come up in end of... That's a heavy question. I don't believe in euthanasia. I believe that hospice will allow for the elimination of suffering at the end of life. Um, our, as a physician, is not in my power to give life or to take life. Therefore, I don't believe in euthanasia. I do understand suffering, though. I really understand how patients suffer um, profoundly with the terminal cancer diagnosis. Um, physical suffering is easier than emotional suffering. The physical suffering, the physical aspects, the pain, the shortness of breath, those things can be managed very successfully. But emotional suffering, and many times it's the emotional suffering that leads to euthanasia, decisions about euthanasia and suicide. Have I had patients request uh, euthanasia from me? Yes, they have. Um, my answer to them compassionately is, I understand your suffering, but no, um, I cannot do that for you. I'm very sorry. But we can do, talk about hospice. Uh, we can talk about antidepressants. We can talk about seeing a therapist, someone who can help you get through this. Um, I, there, there are three classes of medications that are used. Um, pain relievers, morphine and methadone are used most frequently. Of course, there's oxycodone and very rarely would fentanyl be used. But um, typically morphine, morphine is especially useful for terminal dyspnea for shortness of breath. So we use a lot of that in hospice. We use methadone for management of chronic pain, which works very well for neuropathic pain. That's the, the, the nerve derived pain that can be very difficult to treat. Um, the second class, anxiolytics, typically lorazepam is used or um, Xanax is another one that can be used. Uh, we use lorazepam primarily in our local hospice because it's dual purpose. It's useful for relieving uh, anxiety, really useful for relieving intractable nausea and vomiting. It's very useful for anti-seizure medication. So that is a, a workhorse for hospice. Uh, haloperidol is useful um, for management of terminal agitation. Uh, we use quite a bit of that. And of course, other supportive care measures. We use a lot of laxatives because the opioids do cause constipation. So I would say those are the four most frequently used medications, and they're included in the hospice comfort pack uh, when patients are um, admitted to hospice. We want families to have medicines on hand to manage, and, and they're actually taught how to manage um, terminal symptoms uh, by the hospice team. Mm, thank you for that. Um, it, it comes from many years, and I, I have to tell you that I rely heavily upon my faith and spiritual beliefs. That quiet time in the morning between five and six o'clock before the world wakes up and start moving is extremely important for centering myself and um, thinking about what the day might look like and what I have to do, but mostly that's time for self-care. Um, music, um, I love music, um, and finding time to um, enrich myself with that is extremely important. And looking forward to that, and when the day gets crazy where I can't exercise or play music or it just totally spirals out of control, I will create five minutes of doing something that I look forward to, even if it's just going to Starbucks and getting a, a cup of coffee. Just the fact of driving there, greeting the people at the window, getting my little cup of, of warm liquid and, you know, sitting and watching a tree move or, or, or something that just takes me away from the office. But um, that's what I do personally, but also I have a great sense of community, other people around me, my family, uh, my faith community that um, have been invaluable in um, providing support uh, for a very challenging profession. And again, what helps me is the spirit of our patients. I mean, the um, 
stories I hear and the um, courage that I see in patients and family, it, it, it's indescribable. And it gives me um, a lot of, of support as well. Um, I had to have an end of life discussion with a lovely lady. She's only about 60. She's dying of lung cancer. Entered hospice last week. And when I had to tell her after a year and a half of fighting cancer, scan didn't look good anymore. And that it's probably time to stop treatment because it's really wearing her down and the return is getting less and less. She says, I'm really okay, Dr. DeShields. I'm okay with it. I knew this day was coming and I'm grateful for the amount of time I had. And, you know, I, I, it was just, it blew me away. She's just, it, the patients are incredible. And um, that's one of the reasons I've been able to do this for so long. Along with that is the research aspects of oncology. There have been so many breakthroughs and gains over the last 30 years. Um, it, it just fascinates me. Lifestyle medicine, if we can get everyone into lifestyle medicine at your age, maybe younger, uh, learning primarily how to think more consciously about what we're eating. When I was in college, like you, my lunch was usually a Coke and a bag of peanut M&Ms. And so that was a horrible diet. Um, it gave me caffeine and it gave me a joke to, to make it through the day, but you know, that's really, really poor, poor nutrition. So if we could get individuals to think about uh, what we're putting into our bodies um, and um, to make them more um, functional machines, I think that is the basis of lifestyle medicine. The other part of lifestyle medicine is for chronic illnesses such as diabetes, and uh, obesity, um, hypertension. It's been proven that a plant-based diet is one of the most effective um, treatments for those chronic medical conditions. And in some cases, there have been studies to show that a plant-based diet is better than metformin um, in reducing the hemoglobin A1C and blood glucose. So, um, Plant-based medicine not only treats chronic diseases, but if one can fight the obesity epidemic through helping to educate individuals how to eat better and move um, more, um, that's how chronic diseases might be prevented. Thank you. How can patients, caretakers, and families be supported when the patient does not want their caretakers and families to know their prognosis? Oh, that's a good one. Um, I don't run into that as much as the opposite, um, where patients, the caregivers don't want the patient to know. Um, so what we do in hospice is that we, we never say that you can't, um, um, we won't say that we won't tell this patient the truth. We can't lie to them. That's against our personal principles, that if the, someone asks, we must give an honest answer. And we'll, we will tell the individual who's making that request of us the same thing. For instance, the gentleman yesterday who said, don't tell my sister she's dying. My response was, if she asks me, I will have to tell her because she has the right to know and I cannot lie um, to her. Um, so those are ways we get around it. There are boundaries that we have to, um, establish as medical professionals that these are, this is what we believe. And unfortunately we don't quite see eye to eye on that. And I respect your wishes and what you're trying to do, but I really have to be truthful. I hope that helped. Most fulfilling part of my profession is seeing you all. Uh, that is in crazy. It, it, I, it give, brings me much, much joy to see the generation of doctors and health professionals behind me. And I hope I'm so fortunate to have you, one of you take care of me in my old age. Um, so that brings me much joy. Um, and, and I forgot the second part of the question. 
definitely enjoy the journey. And um, I would say never discount anything, regardless of how trivial it might be. You know, sometimes you're wondering, why, why do I have to study this? Why do I have to learn this? This makes no sense. You know, I would never have to do this, <laughs> you know, uh, but everything comes together at some point. And there are things that I remember now that I learned, you know, just serendipitously, and it really made an impact at the moment. Um, so what am I trying to say is that, yes, you're focused on becoming physicians, um, and that is a very laudable thing. Just try to enjoy the journey um, along the way. Um, and I know that it's extremely competitive. I know that it's, um, requires you to push all the time, push yourself to the limit all the time, but at the same time, try to carve out a little bit of time to, uh, for self-care. That's extremely important. Uh, establish good relationships, um, and um, be open to what you learn, other things that seem completely unrelated to medicine, be attentive to those also, because a lot of times you'll use some of that in medicine, people skills, you know, um, how to um, manage conflict. Those are things we do in medicine all the time. And, and, most of all, try to have fun with it. Um, I, I, I can't underestimate that. It's just kind of relax and say, oh, I'm learning this because I'm curious about it. I know I have to be tested on it, but you know, I'm curious about how this works. And if you're curious, you're always going to learn. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much, Dr. DeShields. I know I've personally learned a lot and many of us have learned a lot about what medicine has to offer. We really, truly appreciate it. I love everyone to please give a warm thank you to Dr. DeShields in the chat box. I think that they are pouring in now. Thank you. Yes, we really appreciate it. Thank you so much. And we're seeing all the thank yous pouring into the chat box. We really appreciate our students. Mm -hmm. I will now have Dr. Chima facilitate the closing part of our session. Hello everyone. I hope you all enjoy the knowledgeable facts with Dr. DeShields today, and it will help you polish your skills. My name is Asma Chima. I'm practicing internal medicine in Maryland and affiliated with University of Maryland Medical System. Last week, we talked about help others, serve the community, add value in others' lives. What about self? As Dr. DeShields mentioned, self-care, right? So what do you think? Why do we need to take care of self? Can someone please type in the chat box to share your thoughts, to make it more interactive? Okay, let's see, we get a few responses. All right, that's great. So why do we need self-care? So Dr. Dishil mentioned self-care. So please remember, it's not a race, it's a marathon. You need to be compassionate with yourself to avoid the burnout and achieve your goals. Like in medicine, there are four years of undergrad, four years of medical school, then three years of internal medicine residency, and then two to three years of different fellowships if you want to pursue your fellowship of oncology like Dr. DeShields, infectious disease, and the cardiology and so on. So Dr. DeShields mentioned about the lifestyle medicine and uh, you already addressed few concepts. So I would say lifestyle medicine is all about take control of yourself, your well-being, and improve your health. So what is self? So self has four domains. It's your physical well-being, your emotional well-being, your spiritual well-being, and your intellectual well-being. So today we're just gonna talk about briefly about your physical well-being. So there are four main areas that we need to work on that will help you to move on and take good care of your well-being, take good care of yourself. First of all, physical activity. Make a habit of regular, consistent, moderate physical activity. 
it's vital to keeping your immune system healthy. It should be on daily basis and throughout your life. As Dr. Shield mentioned, she wakes up early in the morning and Dr. Shield does the gardening. So we can do whatever we like, like go for a walk, do bike riding, yoga, stand rather than sit, take stairs, stretch. So any, anything that keep you moving, any movement is better than no movement. And while you're sitting after every 50 to 55 minutes, stand up and just do some stretches and it will release your muscles tension and you will feel good and you'll feel a difference. So please make a habit of physical activity. And next, health, eating healthy. As Dr. Shield mentioned as well, add nutritious diet. And what you eat makes all the difference to boost the immune system with your nutritious food. Consume wide range of fiber filled diet and dioxin rich foods at every meal. Choose a rainbow of fruits, vegetables, whole grains, nuts, seeds, so, and also stay well hydrated with water. So I can share that daily goals for males is 3.7 liters and daily goal for females is 2.7 liters. So please make a habit of healthy diet. And next one, I'm gonna talk about quality sleep. A regular bedtime and wake up time is very important. Aim to sleep for seven to nine hours is optimal. Develop a habit, set up an alarm and avoid screen time at least 60 to 90 minutes before you go to bed and practice your ritual, like writing a journal. You can make up your, you can write down your goals for next day or reading a good book. So any ritual that makes you feel comfortable with. So please try to have a habit. And last but not least, mind your stress. Listen to your body, be compassionate. The stress hormone called cortisol, it suppresses our immune system. So when our immune system is not, is, is suppressed, so we are more prone towards the infections. So please be mindful and adapt some coping mechanism that can help you to manage the stress and as a result, reduce the cortisol level. So it's, management of stress is very important. We will talk more about it. And please keep reminding yourself to take care of yourself, S-E-L-F. <laughs> I cannot stress more than that about self-care. I hope it will help you. So please take care of yourself. At the end, I would like to thank you all Telesharing student organizers, campus ambassadors, all our volunteer physicians, and especially Dr. DeShields today. I really appreciate. Thank you, everyone. I wish you the best, and it's a great award. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Dr. Shima, and thank you so much to Dr. DeShields for such an amazing session this week. Now we're going to conduct our closing session with a few announcements. So firstly, the link to the quiz for this session is now live. We recommend that you finish this quiz as soon as possible as it's due in 48 hours. And just as a reminder, you'll need at least a 70% in order to pass and receive certification for this session. Now onto our next session dates. Our sessions are now going to be on either Fridays or Saturdays, given physicians have busy schedules and they're volunteering their time to mentor us. Our next specialty spotlights include anesthesia and pain medicine, ophthalmology, emergency medicine, and more. These dates will also be posted throughout our social media outlets, so be sure to follow us on our LinkedIn, on our Twitter, Instagram, and follow our YouTube channel. And our handles are all at Teleshadowing. I'm looking forward to seeing you all at our next session on March 13th at 10 a.m. Standard, Eastern Standard Time with our physician mentor from the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. Thank you so much everyone for attending today's session and we hope to see you next week and in upcoming sessions. This concludes the end of this week's shadowing.